We are so excited to be here with you to speak about Orphan Black Echoes. Such an amazing show. It's very unique and interesting. Like, I really enjoyed watching it. I'm, I'm a sucker for sci-fi. and anything Oh, thank you. Like, oh, good. Yes, I love it. Anything that makes me question, like, who's real, who's fake? I love it. So <laughs> I want to jump right in and say, it, it, this is such a unique concept. Uh, how did you come up with this idea? and and what inspired you to write this um well the studio kind of came to me and they were just looking for new takes on the on the original show and they were pretty clear that they didn't want to do the same thing over again because we'd had such a amazing performance with Tatiana and I think you know it was hard to think about doing that again you know because she did such an amazing job um and then also it actually poses some practical problems shooting that way because you have one actor playing multiple people in a scene. So it just takes longer to, to, to get through your days. And so there was, there was some practical concern about doing that over again. So I wanted to find a way into the reboot that kind of allowed for a lot of similar things, um, sort of these themes of identity, um, this idea of found family, and some kind of sisterhood, um, but that that like didn't kind of put us squarely in in, in the place where we were doing the same thing ag again. Um, so I um, I actually spent a lot of time talking to my uh, husband, who was a, a big fan of the original show and was a philosophy professor for many years, mm -hmm. and he um, had uh, done a lot of work on personal identity, and so um, we talked a bit about what. Uh, ideas we could use to kind of play on and so we came up with this idea of of you know different versions of the same person but at different ages and then kind of working out of that um, how would something like that happen and kind of talking about I spoke to a, a scientist at the at a, at a human tissue printing lab um, in, at Wake Forest to kind of filled me in a little bit on all of the amazing things that they're actually able to do already Wow. with this kind of scanning and printing um, technology that exists. So they're printing little brains and little hearts that actually beat on their own. And, and so there was a lot of actually real science to sort of build off of. Wow, that is so interesting. I didn't know that they're able to actually print yeah. mm -hmm. organs and things like that. That's yeah. really cool. Wow. Yeah, okay. yeah it is. It's very cool. It's like yeah. he was he was so delighted to talk to us about you know, the, the future of, of this technology, because it turns out that it is very real. Um, and yeah. so, yeah, it was cool. It was cool. To that is so cool. Wow. Okay, cool. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, with talking about like the original Orphan, Orphan Black, um, mm -hmm. did you have to lean on any of that storytelling at all when you were developing this script? Um, yeah, so we, you know, wanted to connect the world of the old show to the world of the new show. But then I also wanted to be mindful of bringing in a new audience to the new show so that you wouldn't necessarily have to feel like you'd watched all five seasons of the original show in order to enjoy the new one. So I think that helped sort of like limit our choices to a certain extent. And, and so we got the idea to take um, this this little girl, um, Kira's character from the original show, and then kind of imagine a future world where she was all grown up and look at what kind of accomplishments she had made. And I talked a lot with um, John Fawcett, who's one of the co-creators of the original show and one of the, um, he was our producing director on the new show. Um, and, and we talked a lot about like his imagining of what Kira's character had kind of gone through after the old show ended in the story. Um, which was helpful just in terms of thinking about, you know, keeping keeping her close to some of those original family members. And and we, we definitely wanted to be able to bring a few people back from the original show and who was that going to be? And that was all kind of tied up in Kira's, Kira's story from the first show and, and who she would be close to and stuff like that. Yeah, it definitely uh, was easy to watch because I, I actually didn't watch the first one, but I still felt like I'd known what was you happening. Oh, good. Yeah. Oh, I that's felt awesome. like I knew enough and I was like, oh, okay, this, you know, A plus B, all those things. Yeah. So I was yeah. like, 
still following along with the story. And yeah. I did like the first episode, how you did open with um, her leaving the facility, like running away, because mm -hmm. then that made me realize, oh, okay, so this is like her future self after leaving mm -hmm. the facility. So mm -hmm. it was, it, it did tie in. So it's an easy watch. And yeah. I really enjoyed that. Oh, um, good. Were there any um, challenges within developing the script because you are going with the younger version and the older version? Like, how mm -hmm. was that tying that in together while you were writing the script? Um, you know, I think there it, one of the challenges was finding the tone um, of the new show and allowing that tone to embrace the tone of the old show, but then also be its own thing. Because I thought at a certain point, if I was just trying to mimic very specifically the tone of the old show, mm -hmm. I would never, I would never be successful. I used to kind of use this analogy of like paint matching paint colors where, you know, that thing where if you, if you try and match a color that you have on your wall, like exactly it gets really close, but it's never quite the same. And you always kind of see the ways in which it was different. And I, I, I sort of wanted our show tonally to, to have kind of like a contrasting color. So like the two things should sit nicely next to each other, but but mm -hmm. not try and be matchy matchy. Um, right. Right. So that was the challenge in just trying to like figure out that tone for the new show um, and allow it to feel natural to me and my natural voice as a writer and that sort of thing. Um, uh, and then, yeah, I mean, it was it was fun to think about how two characters, um, you know, could have a similar voice, but one one's more mature than the other, and one's had different life experiences than the other to a certain extent. But you want to feel that kind of core person in there because they are really literally the same. Um, and you want to kind of feel that core being in there kind of connect between the two of them. And so that was it, that was interesting to try and find ways in which, even if it wasn't in dialogue, though we definitely tried to 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 do it a bit in dialogue, but um, even if it was just little little gestures or, you know, mm -hmm. we decided they both really had a sweet tooth and like candy, like we kind of like went through and, and tried to figure out what were the, the tiny things that we could use to connect them. Yeah, I love that. And the casting was amazing because they yeah. really do look alike. Yeah. <laughs> was like, oh that was a hard, that was hard. That was hard. I really give a lot of kudos to my casting directors who worked very hard to, to find Amanda. And she's, we got so lucky. She's so talented and wonderful yeah. and worked so hard. And then also does, I think, look a fair, a fair amount like Kristen. Yeah. Um, and I looked at so many photos of Kristen from when she was that age and, and then, you know, looking at all of these um, these different actors and and we had them read together at various mm -hmm. points so that we could kind of feel what they would feel like together on screen. And um, it was a it was a hard it was a hard process. At a certain point, I think I developed some kind of face blindness where <laughs> no, no one looked like Kristen at a certain point <laughs> to me. And everyone was like, no, no, Amanda really looks like her. And I was like, I don't see it anymore. <laughs> Um, You're like, everyone looks the same. <laughs> no, it was just like, everybody looked different. I thought, no, it was, I had like lost my ability to, to sort of make any kind of distinction. Anyway, it was. Fun. Oh, that's hilarious. Yeah, that that's a tough thing trying to get, you know, actors that look similar. I feel like that's the toughest part with old and younger actors in a, in mm -hmm. a um, show or movie. So yeah, you guys, because I think they look similar like a lot like they yeah. definitely look like they could be sisters so yeah, yeah. really good um and so what do you hope since this is a different iteration of orphan black uh mm -hmm. what do you hope viewers take away from this season um i think that the show hopefully asks people to engage in some interesting kind of questioning about what they would do if they were in some of these character shoes. And I think um, I think some people might feel one way and some people might feel another way. Um, and I think specifically around like Kira and her choices and her decision making, um, uh, I, I, I hope the audience kind of gets engaged by 
the sort of moral gray area that we we kind of put her in and to a certain extent that we put uh, the character Daros in. Certainly, um, once you understand what he's after by the end of the season, I think it's, I, I really didn't want anybody to feel like they were overtly good or overtly bad, mm-hmm. that, that we as the audience could, if the writers had done their jobs properly, actually kind of understand where everybody was coming from. Not necessarily that we would make the same choice, but, you know, people aren't necessarily just out for their for their own interest, self-interest, that, that people have kind of understandable motivation um, to a certain extent. So I thought that I thought that was something that I'm hoping people engage with when they're watching the show. And then just the fun of it and the fun of the relationships, I think. Yeah, definitely the fun of the relationships are really cool. <laughs> yeah. I just love the whimsicalness of like just just the iteration of like them being printouts. I just love mm-hmm. that. Um, I think it's a really cool concept. Um, and within the show, are there any like specific themes or messages uh, within the series that resonated with you personally, especially while writing? Um, yeah, so I think the um, the bottle episode in the middle of the show, it's not a bottle really, it's, it's sort of a flashback episode, episode five. Um, which is really a kind of look back at um, at at Kira's kind of primary relationship, mm-hmm. um, and just kind of understanding the like the love and the, and the loss that she experienced. I think those themes of love and loss became very important to me. Um, and once I sort of figured out how to put those at the center of the show, in terms of of Kira's backstory. Um, it really kind of opened up a lot of emotional space for these like lovely moments and conversations between between the characters in the present that that I hope the audience connects with. I mean, I think all of those themes from the original show of of found family and like this kind of commitment to this kind of sisterhood and all of this stuff is really is really great um, and there. Um, but I think I. I got a little, I got a little romance in there. I got a little questioning of like love and commitment and, and loss that all those kinds of themes that are things that I'm very interested in exploring. Right. Yeah. I love that. And it it is very layered, I will say. And I love also to the, um, the aspect of like the investigativeness of it all. Like I mm-hmm. love that we're all kind of like investigating along with them. Uh, yeah. Along, right. So. Yeah. I love that. Um, And how do you approach creating or writing stories like this that has like suspense within like a sci-fi story like this? Like Mm -hmm. how do you approach this type of storytelling? Um, I think that for me, this kind of storytelling is only ever compelling if the audience is very invested in the characters. So I think that, you know, I I often would say like, if we don't care about this person because they don't feel real to us, if I haven't done the work to make this character feel real and have the audience be able to connect with them in a very sort of specific human way, we're not going to care whether or not they live or die, right? Like, that. it's just like, then we can do whatever we want. They can run and chase and hide and seek and do all of the thriller stuff. Um, but if we don't really care about them, we're not really going to be that invested in that journey. So for me, being able to actually take a minute every once in a while to make sure the audience is invested in those people just as people and that they feel real to us helps all of the all of the the thriller stuff and the sci-fi stuff work because then you really are like oh my god what's gonna happen like I do really care whether or not you know she finds this thing or she gets to that place or this person's betrayed her or whatever it's it's just about you know those are just kind of plot complications but if the character work hasn't been done first or in an ongoing way I think it makes it hard to sustain the audience's interest yeah that's true um yeah i love that and within the setting um 
what would you say kind of contributed to the overall atmosphere of the show? And were there any specific like locations or set pieces that you feel kind of brought the show to life? Um, so the show set in Boston, we shot in Toronto. Um, so we were close, but not, you know, I really, uh, I went to school in Boston. So I had this, I really wanted to kind of capture a little bit of a sense of like the history of that yeah. sort of place and the architecture and stuff. So um, we, we had a few kind of, key locations that we spent a lot of time trying to find um and it was it was challenging um just because some of the older fancier neighborhoods in Toronto they don't want a lot of filming there so for Kira's house for example we spent a really a lot of time <laughs> looking at at houses and then we find one we liked and then we'd realize that the permitting restrictions were you know too difficult or that the neighbors were never going to let us shoot there and so it took a long time to find something that really felt like this sort of traditional, you know, Boston architecture house that somebody of Kira's stature would live in. Um, and anyway, so that was one thing that was hard. But I did want to have this mix of like, you know, modern, we used several like kind of modern architecture buildings in Toronto. So there was this mix of the old and the, and the new because mm -hmm. we wanted to feel like we were in the future so we could kind of deploy those exteriors when we needed that kind of sense of a slightly futuristic environment. But mm -hmm. then also like, you know, those houses in Boston are some of them hundreds of years old. So, you know, you can still kind of have those touchstones that feel very familiar also. Oh, yeah, that's cool. I didn't know it was shot in Toronto. That's really cool. You still have like the Boston feel there, even yeah. though that's really cool oh uh, i do want to go a little personal with you uh so what inspired you to write or get into um, being a screenwriter oh um i started out writing fiction and i started in high school and i think i think i was reading i think i just had i was lucky and i had really good teachers who were encouraging me to read short stories and like contemporary fiction that really um, were very kind of compelling and 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 um, felt like this very kind of powerful way to make art. And so I just started writing when I was young and then and then I wrote um, all through all through college. And I had, again, like lovely, lovely professors and um, and people who were encouraging um, but I, I was very interested in writing um, mostly long form fiction novels. Um, and then when um, I was thinking about moving out to Los Angeles and thinking about getting into the entertainment industry, like I had always loved these kind of great TV shows of the 90s, like when I was kind of growing up um, in New York. So like Homicide, I watched a lot of Homicide. I watched a lot of Northern Exposure. I watched a lot of ER. Um, and and there's something about that kind of story that sort of that ongoing you know um, ensemble in particular like dramas that felt like novels to me. So that was kind of the easier place to go. So um, I, I like being able to spend time and develop characters over a long period of time and and kind of really go on on you know journeys with them for many seasons and you know in a, in a book for many many chapters. So. Um, yeah, so that was kind of how that worked for me. I love that. I never thought of it that way. I guess TV writing is similar to like a novel because you are engulfed in that character's life. Like you yeah. on journey with them. I love that. That's why I love TV. <laughs> <laughs> You're like in their life and you you go on this journey and then it's, you know, it ends, but then they come back. Uh, yeah, so. exactly. I love that. And so is there any other like futuristic themes or any other subgenres that you would like to explore? Um, hmm. You know, I, I do like these kinds of shows where everything feels very familiar, but there's just like one tiny thing that's different. Um, Severance is probably like a good example of that in a way where like the world seems totally normal except for this one thing that we mm -hmm. understand to be different. Um, so that's kind of a fun 
that's kind of a fun space that I've been thinking a little bit about. And I have a project with a friend that, that we were talking about, like a, a world that seems like otherwise exactly the same as the world that we live in. But there's just like one little piece that's different. So yeah. you're really able to kind of use that as a lens to look at contemporary society which I think is so interesting yeah I love that so anything like that I'm excited to see that from you (laughs) that is my jam uh that's really fun and would you give any we like to ask this question that's the last question since we're winding it down um going through you know your screenwriting career and being successful what advice would you give to an emerging screenwriter Mm Hmm. Um, gosh, that's a, that's a, that's a hard question. I think, I think it's to hang in there and to keep writing Mm -hmm. and that, um, it's very hard to, it's very hard to break in. Um, and, um, it can be very frustrating. It took me a long time. Um, and I think, you know, surrounding yourself with other people who are, who are writing and working and 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 creating a community for yourself that's supportive is really important and I definitely had that um and then and then just to keep working on the thing and like if you know you write one thing and 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 nobody likes it like just keep keep working on it and trying to make it better or write a different thing and the more you do that the better you're going to get and eventually you're going to write something that somebody's going to love and and it's it's going to work out I hope um but yeah it's just to keep keep doing it I think sometimes we will we'll write something and be like well this is this is it I did it I wrote the thing like now what happens and um and sometimes you just you just have to force yourself to keep going even though it doesn't it doesn't necessarily feel like it's gonna pay off but I think eventually it will yeah Thank yeah. you so much. Thank oh, you so welcome. much for your time. This is oh, so no, my fun. pleasure. I'm glad you like the show. It's nice. To yeah, I love it. Love I it. love it. Thank you so much. It was so cool learning more about it. And, and even like you going and learning about people scanning cells and <laughs> growing organs. Yeah. Yeah. Really cool. So yeah. um, definitely yeah. putting that in the article. That's really yeah. cool. To learn. It's really um, cool. They, they print bladders, actually, like the, the floppy <laughs> organs are easier. So bladders and um and things that don't have to hold structure are easier for them to print tissue for. But they printed a whole ear, I think, recently that I actually put on a person. And Whoa. Like, yeah, like even since past when we made the show, I think they did that like last year. So anyway, yeah, it's cool. Uh, it's cool to look up. There's like, pl- there's like all the, like, it's really wild. It's so that wild. is wild. Uh, because like, you know, you think of those things as only in shows, but they're actually doing it in like real life. Yeah. Yeah, no, they're, they're doing some they're doing some creepy stuff for sure <laughs> wow. well thank you so much for your time You're welcome. You're welcome. Great. we would love yeah. to have you in any program that we work on whenever you have time we'd love to have you part of anything oh, oh great work. thank I'm you here. so much I'm here. happy to do it thank you thank you okay, bye, bye.